on this edition of the Self Publishing Show. One of your comments was, Michael has gone cheap. And I thought, God, God, God damn it, JP, right? Michael has gone cheap. And I thought, yeah, you've nailed it, James. You've you spotted it, yeah. That, that cover cost me 50 quid. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers. No more barriers. No one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome. Yes, it's The Self-Publishing Show with me, James Blatch. And me, Mark Dawson. Hello. Uh, very welcome back. The keen-eyed among you will notice we are wearing the same clothes as last week. So we're doing these two on Good Friday here in the UK. Uh, and that's because this episode is one of the more complicated episodes that we do. It's the Book Lab, which is a fantastic idea I had some time ago to mm. uh, take a book from an author and give it to a panel of experts for them to feed back on basically the presentation side of it, so what you see on Amazon. But that includes the look inside. So it does include uh, some critique on the way it's written. Uh, so we do the cover, the way it's written uh, from an editor, and the blurb, all very important to get it right. And that is fed back to the author. And the last part of today's episode is the reaction of the author. Now, in this case, his name is Michael Parker. He's uh, here in the UK. I think he's in Kent uh, from uh, top of my southeast uh, England. And he has written a book called The Boy from Berlin. So you can find it on Amazon, The Boy from Berlin by Michael Parker. Um You'll read the blurb there. Uh, if you're contemporaneous, i.e. this is sort of, where are we, April, May 2019, uh, you will see hopefully um, the old blurb, but it's important for you if you want to understand uh, how people write and, and where the critique came from to see the before and after, in which case you need to go to this URL, selfpublishingshow.com forward slash book lab five. And you can then download uh, the before and after of everything. So you'll see the blurb as it was before, the blurb afterwards. And included in that is a really brilliant uh, handout from Jenny Nash, the editorial side of it, who's picked up a fundamental problem with the writing uh, that Michael Parker had in the first scene that appears in Look Inside. And she has identified that and produced a PDF. And it's something that a lot of us may get wrong. So very useful. Now, Mark, uh, um, I've recorded all these interviews. You haven't had a chance to see them yet so far. So this is a bit of a journey of discovery for you at the moment. But tell me, first of all, why you chose Michael's book. Uh, well, I've, I've kind of been aware of Michael for a little while in the community. And uh, I, I know he's got some, some good experience uh, as a writer. And writer's books aren't a, a million miles away from uh, what I do. So I thought, rather selfishly, perhaps it would be interesting to look at someone in my kind of wheelhouse, just to see what um, what our panel of esteemed experts came back with, just in case in the very unlikely event I'm making any mistakes, I could uh, pick up could some learn. tips as well. Okay, well, look, we're going to crack straight on with this. But first of all, we're going to start with the blurb. As I said, you can see the before and after if you go to that URL I gave out a few moments ago. And Brian Cohen is our blurb expert who has picked this one up, rewritten it, and frankly done in this that case an amazing job here's brian this is the self-publishing show there's never been a better time to be a writer okay brian welcome back to the self-publishing show and welcome back to the book laboratory i love being in this laboratory i i appreciate that you keep inviting me and uh and thank you for having me we really are, i would like to get to a stage where we we scrub up properly and we put on our scrubs Go into the laboratory. It's a it's a sanitized area. You you, you look ready for it. Yeah, we stand All up. All I know we... about sanitization, yeah. I learned from Grey's Anatomy. Yeah, well, I think that's <laughs> I think that's all you do now as a junior doctor. You watch a couple of seasons, and they they let you go. <laughs> okay, uh, good. Now we've got a really good, uh, interesting one to talk about today. Uh, so, the boy from Berlin by Michael Parker. I'm going to go straight into this. I'm going to read out the before, and then we're going to start to go through the after with you. If that's right. okay. So here is the before. This is the blurb that Michael had up on his Amazon page. What secret spawned in Hitler's bunker can stop Gus Mason's bid for US presidency? Secrets lurk around every corner as Gus Mason strides towards the US presidency. 
And from the Nazi death camps to the steps of the White House, Gunter Harman and Jakob Demski, heir to the Jewish Mafia empire, unravel a mystery that threatens the very fabric of the American way of life. However, as Newark police officer Lieutenant Amos investigates the supposed suicide of a local senator, his investigations lead him deep into the corrupt world that inhabits the underbelly of American politics and closer to the truth. Okay, so that's what Michael had there. And I think we can all agree there's some intriguing plot and story and conceit there. Uh, who wouldn't want to know more? But um, at a glance, I would say there are a few technical problems with the way that blurb is put together. A bit of repetition of words probably doesn't make the most of the suspense. And I, I thought you would have fun with this one. And I've got to tell you right away, let me read out the first line of the Brian Cohen treated blurb. Here it is. He's a black cop with a big problem. His racist murder suspect is the front runner for president. Holy cow, Brian. I just <laughs> thought, because I, I, I know this is not my special area, although I'm learning from you. But I knew, I knew in that blurb from Michael was a gripping, compelling story ready to be praised. That top line is a, it's the best top line you've produced in the book lab so far. It's a killer top line. He's a black oh, cop with you. a big problem. His racist murder suspect is the front runner for president. Fantastic And I start. have to give credit where credit is due, because as you know, I work as part of a team and uh, we kept tweaking this one. We had the, the idea for it to really interplay it. And it's, it's tough. Uh, you don't know always how much to call attention to a character's race. Uh, uh, but in this case, because you have the interplay of a black cop and a white supremacist, uh, it, it's too juicy not to tackle. And we, we were a couple words away, and then uh, I believe it was my, my head writer, Abigail Denard, who, who really found the exact key to turn on this one uh, just to end with the strongest word, and it is, I'm very happy with it. I'm happy we're able to share it here on the show. Yeah, uh, honestly, I think he's a black cop with a big problem. Could by itself be a tagline at the bottom of a film poster, and people would be people would be slapping each other on the back for coming up with that. It's um, it's great, and it's it's it. This is a. I mean, you're right, it's a sensitive area, but in American politics, this stuff's never very far away from the surface, is it? And uh, uh, we won't go into sort of contemporaneous politics, but it's living, breathing, real stuff, which people like to read about and like to page turn about. And uh, there's lots of stuff about why we like to read about that, helps us deal with stuff. But anyway, great, great top line. So brilliant. And uh, well done, Abigail and Team Cohen. Um, <laughs> so the next sentence then, or the next paragraph uh, following that up is, fighting for the truth is a way of life for Lieutenant Amos. So when a senator dies under suspicious circumstances, he refuses to ignore a single lead. But the experienced black detective gets pushed back from his captain when he aims to question a powerful political candidate who just so happens to be a white supremacist. So there, that's, you go into the sort of more detail phase straight mm -hmm. away there and this yeah. was an interesting author submission from michael michael gave us a lot of great interesting details and there were multiple even just from his original description you can see so we've got gus mason this presidential candidate we've got uh gunter and jacob or jacob we we've got these the, these jewish mafia members and we have lieutenant amos the cop and what I, I find is helpful when you have, because this is certainly not the, the, the only multi-character, multi-point of view book out there. There are lots of uh, examples of this. But it's nice sometimes to start more with the everyman, to start more with uh, who is a character outside of this. We have a... A, 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 a racist presidential candidate. We have a Jewish mafia, but when we enter this from more of a character who knows maybe what the reader knows from the beginning, 
And then we enter this, this world where, oh, wow, a, a, a senator died. Oh, wow, he's getting pushback from his captain because there's a political candidate and he's a white supremacist. So it's like we're heightening little by little as opposed to starting with, and, and, and Michael has a good instinct here, starting with Hitler's bunker. Yeah. There's not much further we can go from there. But if we start, especially in kind of the synopsis part, uh, we start from the beginning and work our way up, then those details can have uh, more impact. Kind of layering it on, letting it unfold. Uh, as my editor often uses that word, let it unfold. Um, so a couple of things to pick up on that. One is that I guess it makes sense that Amos, Lieutenant Amos, the cop here, is the everyman. He's, your reader is much more likely, hopefully, in, to identify with him than the white supremacist uh, racist <laughs> presidential candidate, of which there aren't that many. There are, you know, mm-hmm. I'm sure a few, but there are more people going to work um, doing, you know, who would identify more easily with a cop doing his job? So your instinct is from a, is that important? The reader has someone they kind of can identify with? I think in in certain stories, especially like this one, it's really helpful. I have seen, and and we get submissions from genres all over the board, but particularly in these uh, thrillers, political thrillers, serial killer thrillers, we see a lot of uh, authors with the instinct of leading with the villain, as opposed to leading with the policeman leading with the cop leading with the detective and i think that there there can be a description that works with kind of following the journey of the villain because a, a lot of the time and, and i'm sure you'll go into this more on the craft um the craft portion of things but having a, a really meaty villain is a great thing uh but sometimes if you go from that villain's perspective uh, you you do you do lead with your strongest thing and then kind of peter off uh, peter out as as you go along, and so we want to avoid that because we want that crescendo we want that build as you mentioned the layering on and it's a little easier to do that when you're starting with a more relatable character. Okay, and uh, I always like to reference Star Wars if I can, but it's a bit like uh, Star Wars. They've obviously got one of the great villains of all time in Star Wars, but the story is always described as Luke's story and told from his Mm -hmm. perspective. So um, Mm -hmm. that's a good example of how that works. Okay, let's move on. So the next paragraph. As the main suspect's star rises on the national stage, Amos continues digging and discovers a dark conspiracy. I like that first sentence because we want a, already I'm invested in Amos and I want him to win. You know, you kind of you don't want him to give up. You love his tenacity. So you're getting into a little bit of the detail of the story here. Unearthing shocking connections between the death and a Nazi cover up. The detective treads carefully to avoid becoming a target. But the closer he gets to the twisted truth, the more key witnesses turn up dead. And we're going to mention something. I'm going to mention something that we mention every time we talk about this. It's really important. It's critical. You always say this, Brian, that people understand the genre from reading the blurb. And you've Mm -hmm. used language here to to punch people in the face saying, this is the book you're getting. People are going to turn up dead. It's going to be a race against time. Uh, This guy's putting himself in danger. It's a thriller. And that's what we get from that. Yeah. And and, uh, and that's key from if this were you know, a young adult romance, it would have very different pacing too, different words, different pacing. And, uh, and, and we try to really keep that momentum going. You see in, in really every sentence in this paragraph, we have that kind of introductory clause as the main suspect, uh, unearthing shocking connections, but the closer he gets, keeping that pace going almost as the story is ramping up, you're, you're almost uh, paralleling uh, the the what you assume is the increased pace of the story as Amos gets closer to discovering what happens. Yeah, and the reason I mention it is because I think it is the number one fault of blurbs is that they don't accurately portray the genre of the book. And there's the same thing with covers. We talk about the same thing with Stuart every time. So, you know, if your books aren't selling as well as they want, or even if they are, look at your blurb 
and almost read it with your eyes closed, which doesn't make any sense. But try to imagine you know nothing about the book. You read the blurb. Does it convey to you very clearly what genre, what you're going to get with this book? Does it do what it says on the tin? As we have an advertising slogan in the UK. Okay, let's carry on. Uh, can Amos prove the country's most powerful man is capable of murder without dooming the lives of everyone he loves? The Boy from Berlin is a gripping political crime thriller. If you like stunning twists and turns, steadfast heroes and burning quest for redemption, then you'll love Michael Parker's page-turning novel. Buy The Boy from Berlin to see a heinous conspiracy exposed today. Well, I for one want to know what happens. Me too. No. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'm, yeah, I, I'm glad, I, I'm glad that you like it, James. No, I really It's really do. about you more than anybody listening, <laughs> more than, well, uh, We do things to please ourselves, first of all. Um, no, yes. I love this blurb. I think it's excellent. And it's a really great top line. Um, and what I want to do now is, is to go back to Michael's because we'll unpick that a little bit now that we've gone through the way that you've done it. And then we'll sure. come back to the end of yours and just do the technical analysis of that. So Michael's, it, it didn't, for me, I didn't read particularly well. I didn't particularly buy, there's a kind of repetition of Gus Mason straight away. It's a repetition of, of the word secret, I think. So, yeah, what secret spawned in Hitler's bunker can stop Gus Mason's bid for US presidency? Secrets lurk around the, every corner as Gus Mason strides towards the US presidency. That's a lot of repetition in two, the first two sentences, I think. And what it seems like maybe with what Michael was doing was kind of one is is the hook, and then usually you'd maybe have a paragraph break, and then this, the next line is kind of the uh, the first line of a synopsis. But and and I I actually have to remind my team of this from time to time. Just because there's even a line break, you have to look for those echoes. We have uh, Gus Mason is an echo from the first sentence to the second. U.S. presidency is an echo from the first sentence to the second. Uh, American uh, echoes in the third to last sentence and the last sentence. Uh, let's see, there was another one I saw. But but basically, you have to, uh, and, and uh, I believe the plug-in Pro Writing Aid, which is, uh, uh, you can get it for free, you can buy a paid version, but you can use a, a free uh, as an extension, it will show you repetitions. And when you're doing a blurb like this, you almost want to avoid using the same word. You can uh, wiggle a little bit depending on how long your blurb is. But in a blurb that's this short, you probably don't want to use the same word twice at all. And, and that because, like you said, you catch it pretty quickly and, and it feels too repetitive. Yeah, and we should underline that writing blurb is really difficult. Um, people can be very, very skillful novel writers and they trip up a bit in condensing it into this advertising type language. So um, credit to Michael. But the other thing is if you get through this blurb, you come away with an intriguing hook um, for the story. So I think it does, it does fundamentally get there, but... It's you, you don't want to see all the hard work and goodness knows, I know as well as anyone else, how much hard work goes into a novel. You don't want to see it let down by this key few sentences. How many words is this? 300 words, something like that? Yeah, it's, it's 300 or less. Yeah. yeah. I, and and I, I, I want to just piggyback on what you said, James. I would never say that someone who writes a, a blurb that doesn't quite hit the mark is a bad writer. They could have the best novel in the world. It is a different kind of writing, different uh, different areas in the brain being used. It's very editing focused. It's very focused on word sound and word impact and rhythm in in it in a way that a seventy thousand word novel wouldn't necessarily be focused. Yeah, and there's. Is it even an argument? I think that the better you are at writing the long form novel, the worse you're probably going to be at writing the short form <laughs> blurb. They're different, they're very different disciplines. Okay, so um, I won't go through the rest of, of Michael's blurb there, but as always with, uh, with the book lab, you can download the before and after and see exactly what uh, Brian and his team have done. Now, I just want to finish off, Brian, by going back to these last couple of sentences. So you had that third paragraph, uh, which is the kind of uh, jeopardy 
Uh, the task, can Amos prove the country's most powerful man is capable of murder without dooming the lives of everyone he loves? And then a very important bit, which again, people feel, and, and so many of our SPF communities say they struggle to ask people to buy their books. They struggle to say, please buy my book. And they feel embarrassed about that. But uh, this is time to just park that embarrassment and do it in a very clear and open way and sell your book in the last couple of paragraphs. So you've said here, The Boy from Berlin is a gripping political crime thriller. If you like stunning twists and turns, steadfast heroes, uh, blah, blah, blah. And the bottom line, just in case they missed the point, says, <laughs> buy The Boy from Berlin to see a heinous conspiracy exposed today. And, and some do miss the point. I, I mean, really, those three lines is about leaving the reader wanting more. Like you said, uh, uh, that jeopardy that can he pull this off and and you want that uh i know there's debate about whether to have a cliffhanger in a book or not uh and and, and there's we could debate on that uh, seven ways till sunday but in a blurb i recommend having a cliffhanger because you want to leave the reader wanting more those those two sentences that restate the title state the author's name state the adjectives those are reminding the reader what they could get. Leave the reader wanting more. Remind, I got to get my fingers in frame here. I keep going yeah. out of frame. Remind the reader, oh, there we go. Uh, leave the reader wanting more. Remind the reader what they're getting. And then tell the reader what to do. You don't have to word the, use the word buy. We, we've used explore. We've used discover. But what I like about by and what I like about the form of it being a, it's a command. It's it's if you were go want to want to go with the the sentence type, it, it it would it would be showing you in the form of a command. Go buy this book because we're not uh, beating around the bush here. We're saying go do this thing. It's it's not uh we're. we're if, if they miss the point because of uh, whatever else they have going on, whatever other books they're considering, at least you're being clear and direct. And I think that can make a difference. Brilliant. And uh, just to underline what you get with the, uh, the best page forward service, uh, if you download the, uh, the PDF again, you'll see not just that blur, but you'll also see Amazon ad copy. I think there are 10 lines that you can mm -hmm. use uh, in Amazon ads um, and optimizing the, optimizing the uh, Amazon sales page. Uh, there's a link there on the PDF to uh, go and do that. So it's your free class, isn't it? I think I'm doing that. Yeah, I, I, I actually downloaded the PDF to Book Lab 4, saw that everyone else was uh, making them uh, nice and pretty. And yeah. I was just sending you some text <laughs> documents. So so we, we, we prettied it up. We gave you a link if you, if you want to find out more about uh, making sure that you are, it's almost like uh, your own little book lab class, yes. making sure you're as uh, optimized as possible because I know just how important it is to have, if you're going to be doing all sorts of great stuff that, that James, you and, and Mark and the crew teach of, of using a, uh, paid advertising and sending a whole bunch of traffic over to these pages. You want them to be in the best shape possible. So, so that's what the little class is about. And James, I love y'all's book labs. You are doing such a great service to the community to, to share these. And I am absolutely honored for me and best page forward to be a part of them. Hey, no, we're thrilled to have you on, Brian. It's a key part of it. Um, I love the Book Lab episodes. I learn more doing this. I mean, we get we some great interviews, but these are fantastic, uh, just standalone deep dives into the nuts and bolts of what it takes to, to sell a book. And uh, the Amazon ad copy, I'm just looking down them. You, this is also a great job. I mean, obviously the top one you've given uh, Michael is he's a black cop with a big problem. His racist murder suspect is a front runner for president. That's it. That's the line at the bottom of the Amazon ad. And that's a really strong line. So I'm excited to see uh, how Michael gets on with that. Our book lab uh, victims have all kept in touch with us. And um, I was speaking to Nikki Danforth just the other day about it. So I know that this goes into the front line as a result of this uh, experience. And uh, great. So that's it. Thank you so much indeed, Brian. Excellent uh, episode from you. 
Well, thank you for having me. I am, it would never be as excellent without you giving me the guidance and giving the guidance to all of the guests that you provide. You're so kind, Brian. Thank you. We'll see you next time. This is the Self Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Yeah, I was gushing with that because I think this is the best one Brian's done. I think he's turned this into a really exciting blurb and he's he's made some fundamental differences. And I think it's a case probably of Michael being so close to his book, and this is very common, so close to his book, not necessarily being able to see what was the main attractive part of the story. Um, so he had this presidential candidate who had a dark, sinister past and there was a cop starting to work things out. And he really focused on the presidential candidate because that's the big thing. But the, the top line that Brian found was a black cop with a big problem it was like the, the first line. And suddenly it's a much more relatable thing. And it's also quite uh, an interesting political thing, a racial thing, because this is a, a white you know, guy with stuff going back to the Nazi era running for president in America. And you've got this working class cop on the streets of, of Chicago. That is intriguing. It's all summed up in a beautiful top line by Brian Cohen. But yeah, I think, Mark, we can be too close to our own stories to write a good blurb quite a lot of the time, I think. Well, that's why writers have problems doing it. It isn't, um, it isn't because we can't write 100-word paragraphs, introductory paragraphs. It isn't because we don't have that skill. It's because sometimes we, we, as you say, we lose track of the important elements that make the book interesting and distinct uh, or we just don't see those because we've, we've been so uh, enmeshed in the in the plot for such a long time so sometimes it does pay to have someone completely divorced from that process to look at it afresh and to pick out the the, the interesting elements that we might otherwise have overlooked yeah indeed okay look we're going to crack straight on next is the cover and uh, of course Stuart Bache is our cover expert so he cast his critical eyes over Michael's cover of The Boy from Berlin. This is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Stuart Beish, welcome back to the self-publishing formula. You and I have actually met in the flesh since yes, uh, our, yeah. we last spoke. We had a beer together at London Book Fest. Did you enjoy your time at LBF? Yes, I had a great time. It was um, it was extreme. Um, it's just non-stop. And I don't think I looked up from the table, uh, I was having meetings out for eight hours. Um, in fact, someone had to go and get lunch for me and everything. Um, uh, I didn't have a pee break or anything like that for hours. So, but it was um, no, it was really fun and um, uh, it was great to meet loads of uh, SPF uh, uh, students and you guys, obviously, and uh, and have a couple of drinks as well, which was fun. So, what did you do with students? Did they bring their covers to you? Yeah, so it was a mixture of things. For the most part, it was it was like what you know. Some of them were people who were clients who wanted to talk through their briefs and things like that. Um, but for the most part, it was people who um, wanted to you know kind of what we do what we do here. You know, sort of give give a bit of feedback on what they've produced or what their designers have produced. Uh, so that was fun. I wasn't sure how much I'd be able to help, but actually, um, it was um, it was really good. I, f- I felt like I was helping people and and sort of giving really constructive feedback rather than just saying you know that's rubbish start again um so that was good it was just quite intense um yes. uh, and uh uh yeah i was wide awake all night because it was just going through my head because it's so busy there isn't it and it's it is a it's mental. a long experience and um and the crucial question did you get some work out of it uh, uh prob- maybe i don't know i don't think i i wasn't actually there sort of, sort of promoting myself as well actually no i did i did get a couple of projects through people i spoke to on the evening so um okay. which was nice paid your train yeah. for it, at least good yeah exactly yeah okay well let's move on to michael parker's cover as part of the book lab uh today so people will know the story hopefully is a uh u.s politician with a sinister past uh and the if you're looking at the cover, which of course is available in the PDF download uh, and should still be on Amazon at the time this is released, at least, it'll probably be there for a while. Um, the roots of that sinister past are spread out on the South Lawn, are they not? Yeah. So you better, why don't you start by describing, oh, there's a noise, sorry, ignore that. Why don't you start by describing the cover? Uh, so the cover as it stands is, uh, uh, has the uh, White House uh, it has a swastika on the lawn in front of it, and there's a young ghostly sort of boy 
uh, uh, staring up at the White House. The the title is in the in the sky, and uh, the author's name is at the bottom. Um, and from the from you know the first look, it is definitely uh, feels like a thriller, um, but it does need work. Yeah. Okay. So. Um... Right at the beginning, your first view is it says what it does, which we talk about a lot as being very important. But otherwise, this I'm going to suggest you wouldn't be very happy to produce this cover. You wouldn't have shipped that to a client. No, um, there are aspects. I always say this. You know, there are always there. Are, you know, you have to give positives and you have to give credit where it's due. And there are aspects of it that work um, for me. The, my initial thought is uh, it's always the tell uh, for me anyway is the uh, typography. So um, I can tell when someone has, has put it together themselves or has had a friend who hasn't got a lot of, of experience. Um, it's usually the type because it's the hardest thing to, to play with um, and to uh, work with. Um, most people misunderstand it or don't know how to use it. So for a start, um, they've... Uh, put an outline on the type, which like, a lot of people do because they think it gives it emphasis. It doesn't. Um, and it just makes it look a little bit amateur. Um, it's also um, stretched in places. So they've used the same typeface, but it looks like they've pulled it here and there to kind of like fill up the space. And there's little things like that that are just a little bit, um, as I say, that, that it's, to me, it's just instantly screams. I'm not sure what I'm doing, but I'll put some type on it, and it's big and bold, and that will do. You know, I'm, you know, so it 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 screams amateur to me. Um, I'm trying to be positive. Um, yeah. it, the swastika sticker, I'll get to in a in, in a bit, but um, it, basically there are far too many layers. It's once again someone trying to do narrative, like they're trying to tell you everything that you could possibly have uh, in the book on the cover so you have um it's it's to do with the white house it's to do with america but there's something about germany or nazis and there's a ghost like boy on there as well it's so that i'm guessing from what i've read of the blurb and everything that he that's the past that's the boy the ghost is the boy if he is a ghost or it's the a younger person or something like that but it's just a little bit um that's a bit like a statue to me or as it well. could be a statue like, yeah it looks like gray slate but I, th I think it is supposed to be the boy I, I don't think there's a statue of a young German soldier in the, on the South Lawn, but I, you know, I haven't been there. So, um, <laughs> look, I mean, okay. So I hear, I hear the uh, uh, the criticism from your expert eye of of the way it's been executed. Um, I would say also, I think the concept is a really good one, uh, down to the detail. I really like the moody sky. I like the portents, portentous kind of threat that is there that, you know, reaches up from the dark past of this person. And it's the darkest possible past to be had some sort of involvement with the, the Nazis and the Holocaust getting into the White House. I like all of that. And I do like the the shadow, the idea of there being some sort of shadow. Um, but the execution, I, you know, I'm, you're the expert, but I would say as well, this looks like something I could do. <laughs> and I'm rubbish. Um, oh, that sounds very harsh, doesn't it? Uh, but it does look like something that, anyone could do in, in Photoshop and and Michael has done what thousands of authors do I suspect which is he's he's got himself to market as cheaply as possible because yeah. people don't have money at that stage no, of and course not with their and that's first why book. I, yeah well that's why I always say be as simple as possible you know actually what he has there already in, as you say in terms of image like I said straight away I knew it was a thriller because there are aspects to it that work from a thriller perspective so the uh, the white house and the sky yeah the moody sky the White House, the way it's lit up, it's nighttime. That already tells you a huge amount. There's a, a Bill Clinton, James Patterson book, I think, that yeah. uh, did really well, obviously, um, that has the, just, just, the, just the White House and a, a, a huge amount of text, but like just the White House on it. It gives you a, a lot of information there uh, there and then. Um, uh, I don't think the boy is necessary at all, um, right. and the type needs work, but that's something that, once again, if you just removed the boy um, and you played with some clean uh, sans serif type, um, you would be pretty much there. He could He'd get away with that it. himself. Okay, let's talk about the swastika. So I um, understand, obviously, why Michael has chosen to have that there. Um, is there an issue with the swastika in some countries? Yes, Germany, it's legal. 
um, it's actually if you start to show swastikas and things, it can be up to three years, I think, that you can be put away for in Germany um, for obvious reasons. Um, but um, yeah, there are issues. Not Most countries are fine with it. Amazon, I'm quite surprised that they allowed it to slip through. Um, when I've worked with Amazon, the, the publishing side, um, it is on their strict rules list not to have straw stickers on anything. It's on the rules with things like, you know, too much skin and all that kind of stuff yeah. and guns pointing towards you. Um, so I'm quite surprised that it hasn't been picked up already. Um, it does, you know, I've, I've designed covers that have had straw stickers on for tra traditional publishing, but um, I think it's that it's in... Um, it's the context and I know that they have never been able to use it in advertising. So he might struggle if you want to do um, AMS, for example, or something yeah. like that, he might struggle there or Facebook advertising. Uh, if he wanted to use the cover, he might struggle there as well. Um, but um, it's hard because there are American covers, uh, US covers that have used a swastika on when, when they're trying to, you know, uh, say that it's something to do with the Nazis. Um, but it, it is something that I, I just don't even do anymore. I don't even try, uh, it, you know, if it's anything to do with the Nazis or whatever, I tend to go for the, the eagle or, or something, yeah. you know, the, the very sort of hard-edged eagle. Um, it's, it's just something to think about. Well, the, the other workaround that people use, depending on, on what sort of reference it is, how historically accurate it is, is I know things like Handmaid's Tale and some other... Uh, dystopian they use the red flag with the white circle and a black symbol that isn't a swastika but yeah. at a glance gives yeah. you the sense of yeah. the german flags that's another way around it i think people use so there's swastikas one and the other one just while, while we're talking about this that people don't know about i know about from my days as a film examiner occasionally having to cut things out of films is the red cross and the red cross and the red crescent symbols have very special protection uh, you're not allowed to use them, and the very good reasons for that is that when they're flown in very uh, difficult parts, challenging environments around the world, they stand for something very important. Bullets and bombs should not be thrown that way. These people are neutral, and they're yep. going to potentially save lives. And an overuse of them in fiction is uh, well, could damage that and could cost lives, which is, sounds like an exaggeration. But there's very strict rules about red flags, uh, oh, yeah. uh, the Red yeah. Cross, and we would take those out in the old BBFC days if people had inadvertently put them in. Uh, I think all TV companies do that as well. So, yeah, so people don't necessarily know that, um, but it might be worth. And as you say, okay, you can get away with it on your cover in America and in the UK, but when you come to start advertising, you might have to... Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, you might run into uh, trouble. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure that you would come a, um, a cropper with that for certain. So um, I, wanna, I, I was wondering when we talk about the execution of this. So we say the concept's good, and um, that the execution is is n nothing like what you would deliver. Um, and one of those things, and I don't really know quite how to explain it, but you you do do something. You say there are too many layers, but you do do something with kind of textures that create yeah. an slightly artistic feel to it whereas this looks a bit like a brochure about the white house yeah you know there's no there's no um there's no atmosphere to it but you create those atmospheres with yeah. layered textures i think and that's very clever i don't know um how we would teach well you do do a bit of teaching about that in your webinar yeah. don't you well, yeah i do and and, and um in, in you know in the course uh, as well it's it's um I do look at that. It's, it is actually quite simple. When I talk about layers, I mean sort of layers of narrative. There are just too many sort of, I'm with you. you know, things happening and trying to put one thing on top of the other. But but in terms of like, you know, Photoshop layers and things like that, yeah, uh, there are things that you can do that can um, uh, sort of emphasize the, the well, for, for this cover, for example, emphasize the darkness and, and sort of, uh, and the light so that it's, the contrast is kind of, uh, has a really kind of a lot, a lot of impact, but actually, like you know, this image works on its own. The the image of the White House in the sky is is pretty good. You could have some dude on the lawn, a shadowy figure. I mean, that it is a, a thriller after all. You could do a, a sort of Mark Dawson with it and have a, a character walking up to it. I just think that if you got rid of the swastika, sticker, um, uh, the, the 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 ghost boy, and the and tried some new type. I think a person that comes to mind that would work really well in terms of type, if he wanted to use something to emulate, would be someone like Robert Harris. Uh, things like Conclave um, is super simple. It is literally um, it's Saint Saint Peter's uh, that's sort of you know uh, silhouetted 
with a red sky, you know, and, and, and actually you could, you could play with things like that, like having a red sky or a red uh, overlay over the whole thing. And that might give a little bit of the, the Nazi color and all that kind of stuff. There's all sorts of things that he could do. But uh, as I always say, try to, if you haven't got the skills to do it, but you have to do it yourself, try to be simple because that's the most effective way you can do it. Don't, don't try to be clever. Don't try to add loads of narrative. Just try to be simple. And you, and that is the most effective way, like simple type. Don't try to play about with drop shadows or, or, um, it's called a key line or a stroke, which is what he's done on, on, on the cover. Um, don't try to play about with stuff like that. Just a nice, simple typeface, Helvetica, something on your, your own computer. Um, you know, even Arial, if you have to use it, you know, something like nice and clean. Um, and then, uh, one thing I would do then if you do something like that is to remember in terms of typography that it's about hierarchy. So, if everything's the same color, then everything shouts out on the same layer. So you don't know what you're looking at first. Um, so I would either make the title recede back if he wants his name to go forward. So keep it Michael Parker in white. Or if he wants the, because because he's you know a new author, if he wants the title to shout out first and give that kind of nice thrillery, you know, because it is a good title. Um, he, he could make that stand back. And so you change the Michael Parker to a different color, something that reflects the, the color of the cover. Um, and that just pushes it back a little bit. Just having little things like that really help um, the eye. Cause as we always say, literally you spend seconds on it. So um, you want to get all the, the, the salient information, you know? Yes. Okay. Well, you mentioned Robert Harris and it, you know, it's always a good thing when you're designing your cover rather than start from a point of view of, how much of my narrative can I cram onto this front cover is have a look at the successful books in that genre as we, we often say and I'm just looking at, at Robert Harris's interesting father it's on the Penguin page for Robert Harris there's the JCB uh, the, the Penguin page uh, there's a couple of options for Fatherland his famous um, alternative history about Hitler having won the war a brilliant book by the way uh, and one of them does have it has the eagle, but in a small swastika at the bottom of it. And then a couple of the other options, it's obviously been distributed around the world, don't have any um, Nazi insignia at all on them. So it's quite interesting looking at that. But all of his covers have that simplicity that you talked about. Even Conclave, you mentioned for font uh, ideas. Um, you know, it's got a building and a helicopter, and then that's it. And then Moody Sky, yeah, very yeah. stark, drawn lines, nice colors. Uh, it's so, yes. super commercial. That's what that's what we would do uh, in house is is to think of. Um, I don't know if his hardback's any different, but the paperback for certain. Um, this is definitely a, a very commercial paperback because it's it's literally information. You've got place. You know, there's something to do with um, uh, like some sort of army or war or something like that, potentially because of the helicopter, the type of helicopter it is. Um, but but it's religion. Um, it's um, location, it's scary and moody because of the sky, but you have the title and the author name instantly. Um, and that's, and that's, that's exactly what you need to do, especially in this genre, because as Mark knows, and as anyone who works in thriller, action thriller or anything, um, there's so many of them, you need to give that information straight away. Um, someone actually said recently about author names, and asked me, uh, I think it was on one of the communities, um, uh, uh, um, indie communities asked, you know, I know it was on Twitter, actually, someone said, you know, about having big author names, like surely is, isn't that about like you, how well known you are. And, um, that isn't the case at all. And we've spoken about it before, but it, you know, okay. Robert Harris, everyone knows him, Mark Dawson, everyone knows, but it's about the type of book it is. So a lot of psychological thrillers, it's all about the title, massive titles. You see them everywhere, psychological thrillers or suspense, massive titles, lots of typography, and then the author name just at the bottom, um, even if they're massive. It's just about the genre and what looks good and what works well. So if in your genre your author name is massive, then make it big. That's, and, 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 and that will be – that's just part of – and then it will fit in better. Great. Okay, so for somebody who's looking at their cover and thinking, oh, yeah, I recognise some of these um, these observations about the cover, I think maybe mine needs brushing up. I suppose we'd say there are two options. One is to go to 
uh, someone like you at the cheaper end you can get um, pre-mades from several organizations you get designers off 99 designs and fiverr.com yeah you, I, i'm you, not a big fan of 99 designs you're not, okay. i just have to say just have to i um, just have to say just because only yes. five is different but 99 designs is a bit like a gladiatorial pit you throw a load of designers in and only one person comes out all the work and all the hard work that goes into it and only one person wins and might only yeah. get like 50 quid for it I'm just, yes, that's just I, a, I just have to say, it's yeah, just, no, I, you know. I think that's a fair point to make. And um, I think maybe if you're right at the beginning of your career, yeah, for the experience of, of building the yeah, design, system, that might work. But um, yeah, and when we were in video production, we stopped bidding on local government contracts for that reason, because they would yeah. insist on like a 12 page treatment from you every time you'd never win them. Yeah, they'd exactly, always, yeah. always be given to some local crew somewhere and we yeah, had so no, much no. time and effort and they'd have all our ideas. Yeah. Then you get a letter saying, so we gave up on that. Yeah. But that's, uh, that's an interesting point. Um, Fiverr.com is a bit different where you basically contract somebody. And yes, it's different. I yeah. think your price is probably $500, something like that for a cover. Is that right? Um, it's, uh, we, it's five, uh, 450 for ebook and, um, um, 580 for paperback. Okay. And the other option is, uh, is to do it yourself. Um, yep. but follow some instruction and we do have some instruction available for people. So if they go to, selfpublishingformula.com forward slash cover design. There was a webinar there from uh, Stuart, which gives you some detailed look at how a cover yeah, is put it's together. It's a really good webinar. He puts them together so you can go off and do that yourself. Yeah, it's a great webinar. And um, there's some PDF designs that go along with that, which you get to see your genre and how it works broken down. And then there's a course on top of that, should you want to take it more seriously and do it yourself. Good. So they're the options. Thank you very much indeed, Stuart. Thank you, Michael, for going into the lab. We're going to hear Michael's reaction to this yeah. uh, in a moment or two, and then he will go off, hopefully, and make some uh, positive changes, which should reflect in book sales, which is what this is all about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, hope, I wish him luck. And, uh, like, you know, even if he does decide to carry on and do it himself, there's a lot of stuff there that he can do. And just to be a bit simpler, he's got a great image already, so he doesn't really need to worry too much. Um, but yeah, well, thank you, and uh, uh, and uh, pleasure as always. Thanks, Joe. This is the Self Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. So. Stuart's main criticism there, Mark, was it, it looked a bit amateurish, which is the concept was there. They had a swastika on the south lawn of, of the White House, which has its own problems, of course. It's an illegal symbol in some countries, Germany, um, most notably. Um, but it just looked at a glance like some he had done it himself or it wasn't as professional as it could have been. And I do put that to Michael uh, in the interview at the end. So no spoilers as to where that cover came from, but he does explain where it came from in the end. But um you can't really underinvest in your cover, can you? No, it, that, that is, if, if you're going to, if money is tight and you're needing to economize, then there's probably other ways, better ways that you can, you, you can um, economize rather than scrimp on the cover. Because uh, we've said it before, um, it, that is the first thing that readers see. It's more important than the title. It's more important than the blurb. And unfortunately, it's more important than your writing as well. So if you don't get that right, um, none of the other things will even come into play, certainly the writing. So um, it, it, it is definitely worth making sure that your cover is looks professional. It, it stands up to your competition and um, it, 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 punches, it punches its weight. Uh, otherwise, you aren't going to sell any books. So the, the economy would be a false economy if you've, if you've cut costs there. Yeah. Okay. Talking about being professional, my camera's just decided it's too hot again, but people can still see me in a slightly different picture here. I need to get to an ice pack or an air conditioning unit. We'll work that out. Okay. Now we come to a, the meaty, uh, critique that Michael received for this particular visit to the book laboratory. And that is from Jenny Nash, who editorially, uh, has looked after numerous bestsellers in her career. It's a much sought after editor. She read the look inside portion of this book, and identified something that was fundamentally not working for her and has fed back on that. So let's hear from Jenny. This is the self publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Jenny Nash, welcome back to welcome back into the laboratory. We really should Thank get you. white coats if we're going to do this properly and safety glasses. Um, uh, safety glasses for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Cause things could get hairy. Uh, now we they have could, a, they could fly at us. They could. We've, um, Mark selects the books and they are a wide variety. So this time we have Michael Parker's the boy from Berlin and your job was to read the look inside, 
with your expert editorial hat and talk about the writing, whether it's going to be the right sell for people. This is so important, these few seconds people get. And if, if they've clicked on the look inside, you're doing well at this point for them to get to that point. Absolutely. Um, but then you've got a few minutes, haven't you? A few seconds maybe to capture them. So what were your initial feelings about the writing on the look inside of it? Well, it's interesting, the, the look inside option, as you say, because it, it's such a modern reader's tool to be able to just click on there and, and get a quick quick glimpse and do I like this or not like this. And so I, I did that just uh, as I, I would if I were a reader and I, and I read through the prologue. Um, there's just the prologue and a little of the first chapter um, on there. And at first, at first blush, it, I had the sense that this guy is doing really well. So he's got a really interesting setup. It's a really interesting uh, scenario that he presents to us. He's got that sort of thriller vibe really down. And in this prologue, we come to see that we're talking to a woman who's in prison. And, and at the end of the, um, of the prologue, we learn she's the wife of the president of the United States. So that's a pretty great setup. It's it's like, you know, that those the curiosity is raised. Well, what's going on here? Why is she in prison? And there's a line at the end of the prologue that says, um, in there would be the names of stranger, of the strangers, of the loved ones, of the deceit, the cunning, and the violence of the life and death of Babs Mason. Babs is the woman in jail. So we understand that she's probably um set to die that she's going to get the the death sentence so it's pr it's a pretty intense setup for and really great for a thriller so you know you read that through and you think okay yeah that's that's good and the the my job though is yeah. to to think okay why does this guy because if you look at his uh reviews he's this book has been out a little about a year you know, he's got 20, 23, I think it is. Um, yeah, 23 reviews. Um, and I looked up another thriller that was published almost at the identical time that um, is called He Said, She Said by Aaron Kelly that has uh, 1,684 reviews and is a bestseller, is a proper bestseller out in the thriller world. So here's two thrillers that came out at the same time. And, and the, the boy from Berlin it has 23 reader reviews and not a lot of traction that I can tell out in the marketplace. Uh, Amazon reviews are only one metric to measure. That's something for sure that must be said. But a pretty, a pretty good metric for a, in a lot of cases. And I also went out and looked just, you know, is this guy a cult a cult favorite? Does he have a big following? And, and the answer is, you know, no, he's a, he's a guy who's selling some books, which is great, but, but wouldn't it be better to be selling 1,684 uh, raving fans um, instead? So what you do then is you think, okay, well, why? What, what is here that is missing if he's got this great premise and this great setup? And, and really, to be honest, there's, there's a line in the, that prologue that I flagged that was beautifully written um, which, which I will read to you. Um, this is a woman speaking and, and it's, it's Babs. And she says, Babs thought of her youth, her beauty now faded. The silky blonde hair had become dry and gray like thin cords. It was no wonder she was over 60 and her years in prison hadn't helped. She studied the backs of her hands where the truth always rested. Whatever face a woman tried to present to the world, whatever falsehood about her age, the truth was in the hands. I mean, that's lovely yeah. writing. A man can write, right? It's beautiful. It's 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 lyrical. It's it's got meaning. You know. So yeah, he's got this great idea. He can write. So why is he not, you know, selling more books? Why is this not getting more attention? And so the answer to me is 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 quite obvious. And, and that's um, an interesting thing to note because um, many writers probably think, well, I could write like James Patterson or I could like, I, mine's just as good. You know, why is that guy, you know, but the, the, the difference between good and great is, is in the subtleties. 
And, and there's two things that um, our author, Michael, has done here that um, are automatically confusing the reader and putting the reader in a position of a frustration and a disconnect. And it that's you can't really see it necessarily if you're just if you're just going in and reading through this. But the reader feels it. They feel it. And that's the thing that we've really got to think about is, is what is your reader's experience of any, of any story? And the reader comes to story. There's a tacit agreement between the writer and the, and the reader. And there's a promise that the writer makes. And that promise is I'm going to present to you a consistent narrative. It's going to be told with authority. It's going to feel like real life. And, and depending on the genre, there's other implicit things that the writer promises. So for instance, in a uh, memoir, the, the writer is promising that this it happened to the best of the, the writer's memory um, to, to remember. Um, in, you know, in a mystery, there's a promise that there's a dead body and that somebody killed the person, <laughs> you know, like it's, there might be different things. So in a thriller, um, you know, there's this, this, implicit promise that you're going to be taken on a ride and it's going to be exciting and dramatic and thrilling. And in this case, it's going to involve the president's wife. And, you know, those are the things we come to. So you, you come in and you've got these expectations and, and there's some subtle things that this writer is doing that is, that is breaking some of those promises and they're, they're subtle, but the reader's going to really feel it. And so I want to, I want to walk you through what those are so that, so that, our listeners can hear it. And this is the next, this is like next level kind of um, editing, right? And it's how a guy like this with a great premise who can write gets to the next level. And um, I mean, unfortunately, I, uh, my feeling, my very strong feeling is it's almost impossible to find these things in your own work. And it's, it's just, you've got a, um, well, what's called uh, neurologically the burden of knowledge that that you know what these things are so you, you don't see them and you know too much exactly so you really need an outside perspective or outside eyes which is that um the danger of self-publishing so this book was was self-published and there's not one solitary thing wrong with that self-publishing is awesome it gives us amazing power and access and opportunity but in order to do it really well you need to bring on board people who can help you go from good to great. Otherwise, you're going to just put a book out that's okay. And nobody wants a book that's okay. The, the reader doesn't, the writer doesn't, it doesn't do the world any good, right? Yeah, and, I think it's Hugh Harry said on our program, every book you write must be the very best you could possibly get it. Exactly. And nothing less. Exactly. And, and so the idea that just because you could you could publish it. You should, you know, if this writer had taken a little more time, perhaps brought in an editor or coach or, or even a proofreading friend, a, you know, uh, somebody who could just see in a different way, it would have improved. So I want to talk about the things that I saw because there's two and they're, um, they're related. So the one is, is something we call head hopping. Have you heard, have you heard this term on this show before head hopping? No, but can I guess it's where the um, point of view changes during a scene, yes. is it? Yeah, okay. Yes, exactly, exactly. So there's some extremely egregious head hopping in these opening um, prologue pages. And I'm going to show you how that puts the, the reader back on their heels. It, it confuses them. It's, it's actually sort of upsetting. Um, if you, if you can track your own response to it, it, you get angry because the, the, the writer is not taking care of you. They're breaking that promise. And it is in fact a violation of, of point of view conventions. That's exactly what it is. And, and so there's the readers are really smart. And they're going to feel it. They're going to see it. They're going to know it. They, they will not be able to name it in a million years. They, they probably would not be able to say what it is or why it's happening or why it bothers them, but they will feel it. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk about that head hopping. And then there's, um, really twisted in with it is another thing going on, which is some, some logic, 
internal logic problems. And, and by logic, I mean, I've been thinking about this a lot lately because writing is, is not usually thought of as logical. That's not a thing that, that a novel that people will often, a term you would often use to talk about it. But, but there is an internal logic to a story and it's, and there is cause and effect. And there is these relationships that you're building a world for your reader and you want them to believe in that world. And the thing about our world, our real world, um, is that physic physically it makes sense, you know, like the rules of gravity hold, um, uh, the rules of human nature tend to hold, uh, you know, we're constantly surprised by events in our world or disturbed by them or what have you, but, but they're, they're just people being people, right? People are going to be greedy and jealous and, uh, you know, all the things people are going to be mentally ill, you know, there's randomness in the system. And, but, but the, but the, the rules of how we, how we behave with each other and how we are, they hold. And when you're building a, a world in fiction, you're presenting to your reader. That's part of the promise, right? I will build you a world that is makes sense. It might not be the real world. And this is not fantasy or sci-fi. This is happening in, in, you know, uh, present life. Um, but there's this illogicness in it that, that, um, feels what actually happens is you begin to distrust the writer. So, so this is really what we're talking about is building trust and, and building authority and being, uh, being the authority of your story, being the God of your story and really thinking in terms of, I'm going to take my reader by the hand and I'm going to, I often use this metaphor. I'm going to lead them through the path in the woods. I'm going to take them by the hand and lead them and I'm going to show them what they need to see. And I'm going to make meaning as we go. And we're going to arrive somewhere at the end that's going to, whatever the thing is, delight them, educate them, entertain them, make them forget the world for a minute, the real world for a minute, you know, whatever your goal is. But, but you have to be in charge. And that, the writers that we love that, that get a lot of book sales, that's what they're doing. And, and, the, and they do it simply, I think. Yeah. without overcomplicating it. James Patterson does it simply so you don't have to fret and um, Dan Brown's another one. And I yeah. love that analogy just for a moment because I just imagine when you said take the, the reader through the hand that the reader's blind and yeah. only knows what you describe to them. So if you start misdescribing yeah. things or you leave things out, they're in the wilderness, they're lost, they're going to trip, fall over, not yeah. know where they are and that's not going to be a fun experience for them. Or if you assume that they can, they can make their own way or that they'll figure it out. Yeah. It's, and you know, you mentioned Dan Brown, he's a, a great example because when his books come out, there's always this flurry of criticism of people who say, well, but he can't really write, you know, he's not a good writer and, and these stories are so obvious and they're so, you know, like there's this flurry of criticism but if you look at what he's doing from a story perspective, it's brilliant. And, and to your point, it's seamless and you get to fall into his world and, you know, a world in, in, I'm thinking of, um, Da Vinci code where he's going to pretend that uh, now I'm going to, I'm going to betray my, my reading brain. I read it so long ago, but he's going to pretend that that it's it's that Jesus had a child who's alive, right? Isn't that what it is? Yes, there's descendants of <laughs> Jesus and Mary Magdalene, but you can't tell anyone, otherwise the cars will appear outside and cart you oh, off. Oh yeah, yeah. It's all Sorry. a conspiracy. It was a gripping <laughs> story. I mean, but but it's the point is that it's whatever you believe, it's it's a radical proposition, and and he makes a world where you believe that that could be true. And, and I mean, that's why people got so upset. Actual real people in religious institutions got so upset because it felt so real. And, and it felt, you know, when you were in it, it seemed real and people believed it. I mean, what a genius thing for a work of fiction to do, to get real people in the real world <laughs> upset about a fictional construct. And, and he, that's the genius that, you know, so his gazillions of dollars that he's earned more power to him. So you're never going to turn down a page in a down Brown book and read a beautiful sentence. It, it, that's not, that's not what he's doing. It's not what it, it's about, but the, the, 
fundamentals of story are so sound. And um, yeah, I would urge after our discussion, I would urge your listeners to go read. I mean, I pulled out this, um, he said, she said, just because I thought it was interesting. It was the exact same period of time as our writer, Michael, um, that the book had been out. And, and I read the prologue of that and I tried to find something wrong with it, you know, so to, to kind of for the benefit of the doubt here, right? It's the first couple pages and could I find anything wrong with it? And, and I mean, not one thing. And I have, I don't think your listeners are going to be able to see, but I marked up Michael's. You can see it's all marked up and I, I literally could not find one thing on, on that. So that's the difference between yeah good and great and look read dan brown and try to find head hopping like i dare you it you will not be able to do it so um let's let's talk then about what head hopping is and and in this piece how we see it so so as you correctly guessed congratulations that was good um thank you <laughs> well the li lizette who you have me working with does occasionally say how would she know that in a scene and i haven't I haven't head hopped but i've just described something that unless I've made it clear that she's looking or she's on the other side of the room, that doesn't make, and of course she's right, it doesn't make any sense. So just even erring towards... So I get told off every week if even I err towards <laughs> the point of view being slightly uh, confused. Well, this is the genius of having a coach while you write is you catch yourself and you build your muscle and you learn and you, and you told me this earlier, you begin to say, you hear that coach's voice in your head, like they're going to call me out on that. That's a problem. I got to fix that. And then that becomes your own wisdom. And, and the thing that you're describing is, is also a POV violation, which is how would a character know that? How would, how would you know what somebody else was thinking? How would you know what, if you're not looking, how would you know if you weren't there? Those, those are also there, there, the, and that's why they also connect to that idea of logic I was talking about. They're illogical. It doesn't make sense that that person would, would know that thing. So it's kind of two problems tied up in one. And, and they're very, um, it's very easy to do because my goodness, you're trying to create consciousness that's what a novelist yeah. is doing right we're You're, god yeah you are it's awesome that's why it's so fun okay so head hopping is when um you're in third person the third person point of view which is uh there's two different forms of it there's there's what's called third person limited and then there's third person omniscient so we all know what first person is because that's what we used to talk in every day i went to the store I bought milk, I came home. It's the I. Third person limited, sometimes also known as third person close, is when the writer is very closely following one character. So they've limited their point of view to the one character, but they're still following that character like God. So they're they're looking down upon them. They can see into their head, they can see into their heart, they can see into their mind, they can see into their motivations. They're they're talking us through describing about that character as they go about their story. And that that that, that does not mean by the way that that the third person close narrator gets a pass on letting us into that character's um, actual feeling and, and heart. We still really need to be inside, even though the narrator is technically outside. So it's a, it's a kind of a um, confusing thing, but I, I just want to say that while I'm describing it, because people sometimes think, oh, I'm writing third person. That means I don't have to talk about their emotions or their feelings or why they're doing things. Nobody gets a pass on that. Um, the third person close is just a way of telling a story. So this, we are also very familiar with this because it would be James, uh, my friend James went to the store and bought milk and, and brought it home. So now I'm just, I'm talking about you. Um, now I don't know what's in your head or your heart, but the, the narrator of a book does. So the other form of the third person is third person omniscient. And this is where it's just like it sounds that this outside narrator can see into everybody's head and heart, all the people, all the people at the grocery store. Um, we can know what they're all thinking and feeling and wanting and doing. So this is very powerful and it's very fun to write. It's very fun to write in all these forms. One of the things that's, that, that is a truth about 
um, writing and all creativity is that creativity thrives with boundaries. And, and you know, um, right now it's, um, when we're recording this, it's March. And in America, there's this March madness. This is all the basketball. And, and um, everyone's, you know, up, caught up in the basketball. And the reason basketball is fun to play and to watch is because there are rules and everyone agrees to follow them, right? <laughs> that that's the way sport works. And, and, um, the same is actually true of creativity that everybody agrees what, what a novel is and how it works and what these conventions are, these points of view conventions are. And, and the limitation on the writer is part of what makes it fun to, to create and also fun to read is, is that promise to the reader, these boundaries. And so you want to follow the rules and follow the conventions. And if you're not going to do that, just make sure you tell yourself, I am writing experimental fiction. There's nothing wrong with doing that. A lot of beautiful writing has come out of people saying, I'm going to write some very experimental thing and I'm going to play with this convention or I'm going to turn it upside down or I'm going to blatantly, um, you know, uh, what's the word, you know, not do it, <laughs> but, but that's an intentional and conscious decision. If you're going to write a, a, a straightforward narrative, you, you need to agree to follow the rules. So, so the rule with, um, an omniscient narrator who can see in everybody's head is, is that they can't do it all at one time. It would be very confusing to do it all at one time. And that is in fact what head hopping is. So head hopping is um, going from person to person to person, being in their head all at the same time and dumping that on the page. And the writer, it's up to the, I'm sorry, it's up to the reader to sort it out, to untie it, to unknot it. And it is so hard to do. And, and people will complain and they'll say, well, Jenny, that's ridiculous. Um, you know, I read and they'll come up with some book whatever, where we're in this person's head, then we're in this other, well, Dan Brown does it. We're, we're, we're in this person's head. And then the next chapter, we're in this other person's head. And then the next person, we're in that person's head, you know, the bad guy, the good guy, the thing. And it's like, yes, that's correct. But it's chapter by chapter. Yeah. Different times, different scenes. Right? Or different scenes. Yeah. Um, the, the violation, that point of view violation of head hopping, um, people tend to do it actually sentence by sentence by sentence. And that's what, um, our writer Michael does. And I want to show, I want to show in the opening couple paragraphs, how that looks and how confusing it is for the, the reader. And, and again, the reader probably has no idea that, that they're, um, on, on unstable ground here but, but they really are. So the, the book opens with this line about Babs Mason. She's, she's, we find out the president's wife. Um, and, and Babs Mason kept picking at the loose thread in her prison skirt. And so we're in her head. We, we, we think it's her story. We're following along. We're, you know, she's in jail. We get that. And then, and then the sentence that begins when the young writer sitting opposite got no response to her question, she put it to Babs again. Well, my goodness, now are we in the young writer's head? I don't know. Um, is, is it her story? Is it the writer's story? What happened to Babs? Is, is Babs the object of the young writer's attention here? And, and it's the young writer's story? Or, you know, we don't know what's going on. At, at all. And there's the line, uh, she put it to Babs again. This is the young writer. When the young writer sitting opposite got no response to her question, she put it to Babs again. So now we're actually back in Babs court, right? It's like tennis. So now we're in Babs court because, well, it literally says she put it to Babs again. But then the next sentence, she had a small voice recorder beside her and a notepad resting on her lap. I to, so, said to myself, wait, Babs does? Babs yeah, we don't does? know who that is. <laughs> yeah. Right? And and so I'm not even a paragraph in and I'm like, wait a minute. Okay, Babs is in prison. There's a writer there. I get that. The writer's asking her questions, but whose story is it? And the, okay, yeah, obviously it must be the writer that's got the voice recorder. So that's me trying to put logic on it, right? Like, well, of course it's not Babs. It's got to be the writer, but then why... 
why was I made to have to figure that out? Why was I made to even have a moment of wondering? I'm, I already have a mistrust of this writer and a distance because I'm, it actually feels antagonistic. I'm like, why, why are you making me work that hard? So the, the next paragraph, what year was it? Babs repeated the question finally, turning to look at the young woman. Well, now I'm just completely lost. The, the writer was going to put it, put a question to Babs again. And we have Babs repeating the question. So in fact, that's the logic problem. In yeah, fact, the a... young writer, <laughs> right? The young writer does not put a question to Babs again. Babs put a, puts a question to herself. So two, that's the, why I said there's two things happening here. There's, there's a logic that that's not logical. If, no, if when, so when the young when the young writer sitting opposite got no response to her question, she put it to Babs again, and then a moment later, Babs repeated the question finally, turning to look yeah. at the young woman. So you've got two but, different people asking the, who's asking the question, right? So we're in all these people's heads. We don't know whose story it is. We don't know what we're tracking. We're we're mad because it's not logical. We're having to make up the logic ourselves. And and look, we can do that. I can figure this out, right? There's a woman in prison. Somebody's come to interview. She's got it. She's asking quite like I can figure it out. But why are you making me work so hard? If if you read, he said, she said, you do not have to do any of that work as a reader. You're just in it. And and the um, you know, people get confused about this because. One of the pleasures of reading is, in fact, doing work, right? You're When you're reading, you're trying to figure it out. You're trying to put the puzzle together. You're trying to sort it out. You're trying to keep ahead of the reader. That's part of the fun of it. It's like doing a crossword puzzle. You, you put your wits in there with the writer, and that's fun. And we want that. We absolutely want that. But we don't want it about the logic of the story. That's ruining. It's like spending your capital and you're spending your capital on silly things. And, and so instead of my asking, what did Babs do? Why is she in prison? Why has somebody come to speak to her about that? You know, those kind of questions to, to get into the story. I'm asking, yeah. wait, who's, who's talking? talking? <laughs> yeah. Wait, who's got the recorder? Wait, I thought she was putting it to the question to Babs again. Who, who's that? Wait, I don't get it. And, and this goes on through this whole prologue in, in um, sort of excruciating detail where, where we never really know who's, whose story it is. And at the bottom of page four, it's the second page, but it's numbered page four, um, the, the, the young writer says, would you say that was when it all began? And Babs smiled. The truth is that it all began a long, long time before that, but none of us were to know, not then anyway. The writer says, could you elaborate on that? So at the end, they, they begin to talk about a thing that they refer to as it. And we don't know as the reader what it is. So it is obviously something big. There was some big conspiracy, some big thing went down, some big reason why this woman is in jail. And, and then we're going to find out that, in fact, she's the president's wife. So so the it is sort of one of those, con, not conventions, one of those things that the writer has done to make us guess and make us turn the page. And in yeah. fact, it would. It would yeah. if, if these other things weren't there. Yeah. But when I got down to those it's, I was like, okay, I give up. That's not fair. Now you're asking me to hold yeah. in my head. So had that been the only right? thing you were asked to think about, the correct thing you yeah. should be asked to be intrigued about rather than who's talking. <laughs> and that doesn't make any yeah. sense. And and I had to read that three or four times to try and work out. Yes, I see what you're saying. Yeah. And, and, and the great shame of this um, is that the writing's great. As you pointed out great. at the beginning, the actual description the language, the vocabulary, it's a very nicely written thing. It just doesn't make it any is. sense when you start to try and follow it from a story point of view, if you're trying to work out who's right. So there's, I, there's, there's an urgency for Michael to fix this because he's a great writer. Yes, and if I I haven't read the whole story, so I don't know where how it goes from here, but let's just assume that the whole thing is, in fact, 
this good from a from a story perspective. It's this interesting, it's this, you know, where this curious, these characters, something happened that's intriguing. Like, let's pretend that's true. All he would need to do to, to get this to the next level is to go through this very carefully, line by line, probably with a, a, a editor or coach and just and just fix these moments of illogic and confusion and and making the reader um, work so hard. And he would be at a whole different level. And it's yeah, it is a shame because um, the reader will the reader will let you. Um, what's the word? I keep using all these met metaphors. It's like it's like we're playing cards and the reader has this, this hand of cards that they're holding close to their chest. It's okay to hold one back. Like, it's okay. Would you say that was when it all began? And, and the reader's going, what's it? Like, that's that's okay. But not when you're making them guess about all these other things. Now I'm just mad and and I'm not going to buy that, that book. After two pages, I'm not going to buy that book because, again, I don't know if I could articulate it if I'm a reader or or say what it is or why it is or why it's different from he said, she said, or James Patterson or whatever, but I would feel it. I would feel that it, like I said at the beginning, it's a kind of an anger. It's a kind of like, why are you doing that to me? <laughs> yeah. And this and, is a, this is a, a, a simple fix. Really. If you just write the mm -hmm. scene, imagining you are one person and you can't put mm -hmm. yourself in the other person, you, you can describe how they look and notice that they look a bit, annoyed and they ask the, have to ask the question again that can all come from the perspective of one person it doesn't absolutely and in fact that is um that is the really sophisticated skill is how do you stay in one person's point of view and convey what everybody else is thinking and feeling and doing and wanting and what their agendas are and all of those things and there's there's so many tools for doing that from um, well, it's what we do in, in our real life and as yeah. human beings, right? We we're see that in expression. We read the body language. We're we constantly. feel a bit, we change our mood because they are starting to get aggressive. You can paint the picture of how people are behaving around you and, and guessing how they're thinking. And it's more interesting because how we think someone else is thinking is not necessarily how they are thinking. The reader, that's what Dan Brown, I think, does well, is the reader can be one step ahead and work out, no, you're misreading that because they know something you don't or... Well, James, you've just described the incredible power of, of a novel and the incredible appeal of it and also why it's so hard to write is because that's actually what we're trying to do is to capture the experience of what it's like to be a human being going through the world, trying to make sense of it, trying to figure it out. You know, I said before that there's rules that hold, but within those rules, there's all kinds of crazy behaviors. And, and we're just constantly trying to figure out, are you my friend or my foe? Can I trust you or not? Do, are, do you have my back or not? Are you going to stab me in the back or not? You know, socially, we're trying to figure that out. Um, emotionally, we're trying to figure that out. Physically, I think, well, some people in some places in the world absolutely trying to figure that out. Um, you know, um, and and that's that's the game of being human. That's what we're all trying to do every day. And that's what a novel, why it's such a powerful art form, is because it mimics that and it lets us it lets us experience that from the comfort of our own home. We don't have to be in prison or in danger or the president's wife or what have you to feel what that might feel like and experience what that might feel like and, and be in it. We want to be in it and we want to be in it. It's, it's, um, Lisa Cron, um, author of story genius and wired for story. She calls it, uh, the world's first virtual reality, uh, a, a novel, a narrative that we really want to be in it, be immersed in it. And, um, so yeah, this, this would be, an easy fix if Michael had somebody just going through and picking out and showing him where he's doing this. I think, I think he could do it. And, and people who are themselves looking at their own work and trying to understand how not to make this mistake. Uh, I think the two keys are just really be clear on your point of view, really understand what point of view you're holding and telling your story from. And, and then, always focus on one person at a time. That's, that's the key. And one head at a time, no hopping from head to head. No, um, you know, um, you know, if you think about that again, from that logic point of view, like that's the trick is, um, just be intentional about your point of view and focus on one person at a time and focus on letting us inside 
And, and then I would also say, always be sure to look at your work for, for logic holes. Um, people tend to only want to look at the beautiful sentences or the lyrical thing or the way it flows, but logic, these logic problems are more likely to, uh, dissuade a reader than, you know, language that's not beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> that's the Dan and, Brown lesson. Yeah. And the logic problems, I think, can be big, big plot things that people notice. They can also be small things. As I was talking to a writer friend the other day and who said, you know, you, they can't, your hero can't leave home with its trousers on. It's an old, old adage, isn't it, for writers? Yeah. You can't have them starting to dress and then forget to finish that bit and they walk out again. So logic can be small bits of the scene, which will Absolutely. just take the reader out of it and uh, jar. Yeah, you want that that you want your reader to trust you and and they're going to trust you when you when you take care of them. This contract, I like this uh, this this contract you have. You basically set a contract at the beginning with the reader that I'm going to mm -hmm. work within this framework. Mm -hmm. And um yeah, it makes perfect sense. So that's the that's the uh, point of view, the head mm -hmm. hopping, and there mm -hmm. was another aspect you wanted to talk about. It was the logic. About. It was oh, the logic. logic. Okay, they're the two yeah. things. Okay, great. That's, I mean, they're brilliant. I've got a couple of things I noticed. I just wanted to pick up with you. Um, yeah. Just reading this. Uh, two things. First of all, what did you think of starting the prologue and the book itself, the first chapter with the first, with the same words, Babs Mason was waiting for? Is, is it deliberate? Was that something you'd avoid? Well, I actually had some, um, uh, let me just grab my pages here because I did, I did have some, quibbles with the way this writer moved from the prologue to to chapter one and I I myself um I was studying it obviously but I must have gone back and forth <laughs> three different times because the the prologue was all about what year it was if you look at page one of the prologue the question that we you and I were talking about that is repeated is what year was it and then the writer says, the, yes, the year you met your husband. And then further down, she says, Bab says again, the year I met my husband. So there's three stated uh, questions about the year, that this is clearly important, the year I met my husband. And, and it's, it's actually the fourth time the question has been asked because at the very the first mention, it's been repeated. So this idea, what year was it, is, is super important. And then we get to chapter one. So this is that idea of promise, right? They, they're talking about the year and, and they're, they're, this, is, this is what we're worried about. And then we get to chapter one. And I don't think that it's about the year she met her husband. It's about the year that, well, the moment I think that she believed her husband was going to be president. So at the end of the prologue, she actually switches and she says, Babs, she says, perhaps I should start at the moment I knew my husband was going to be president of the United States. So there's, well, there's I mean, all this teeing off to the year, this year, yeah. and then it goes to a year, but it turns out not it's to be not the, the year. year yeah. no, it's and another she, year. And I don't know if, I mean, that last line of the program is a fabulous line because that's the moment we realize she's the wife of the president. But and I don't know if she switched it on purpose. And if, if the, if the, if the um, character switched it on purpose, in other words, but if she did, that's the place like being inside her head where I would want to hear her say she didn't want to answer the question about the year or she didn't want to go there or she knew that if she went there, X, X would happen. So instead she said, well, perhaps like that should be on the page if she's actually making a conscious decision to switch on the reporter, but she I don't know if that's the writer or the character, in other words, a, a lapse of the writer or the character. But uh, as a reader, I again felt cheated and gypped. I was like, wait, I thought we were all about the year that they met. And now um, the reason that I, I was confused is that that first line of chapter one is Babs Mason was waiting for her husband. So this is what I did. I was like, wait, I thought we were talking about the year she met her husband. She's already married. Is this a different guy? And then I went back to the prologue to make, to double check. Did I read that wrong? So you've totally lost the reader and, and you've, they're so confused actually. And they're so off guard. And now they're, it's actually sort of an antagonistic relationship. You're like, 
you're making me work too hard and I'm angry at you. So I was not in answer to your question. I was not so concerned about the re repetition of the name of the word as I was that logic thing. Cause, cause I couldn't figure it out. Yeah. M much more serious. And I've got one other small thing. Mm -hmm. Cause I'm learning, I'm learning how to write as you know, Jenny. And um, yeah. I find myself, I think I do this, what Michael has done here, which is he says is a nice line that description at the beginning uh, that Babs Mason kept picking up the loose thread in her prison skirt. Next line is, it was almost like an unconscious gesture, twisting it in her fingers as she looked around her cell and up at the bulkhead light recessed into the ceiling. Nice prose. The word almost there, I do that, and I've stopped myself doing it. So I kind of, I don't know why, I just introduce this vagueness to something. And I reckon that sentence, and I, I'm taking them out now, works better if she says it was an unconscious gesture twisting it in her finger she looked around herself but it's funny I do exactly that and I think it makes it a stronger sentence if you're saying he was slightly this or almost that try to I think try taking that out it just makes it a better sentence I'm just beaming from ear to ear because I'm so proud of you I on my little thing that I marked up I don't know if you can see I circled oh. all the almost there you go. It's, there's almost all over the place. And that's that same thing, actually. It's, it's, I'm here to trust you. I'm here that you're taking me on this journey and you're taking me down this path and I'm giving you that authority and, and I'm trusting that you have it. Why are you equivocating like that? Was it almost yeah. or was it not almost? It, it weakens it, doesn't it? But I do that as well, Michael. So I'm, you know, yeah, but I'm, I'm picking it up now. And it, well, and you can see that all these things add up. I mean, you can hear me. I'm getting so angry. Like, like, <laughs> don't oh, do it, Michael. Like, come on, you've got such a good story. And, and yeah. I would refer your listeners to a new book, which I have not read, but I have read an excerpt of, um, it's called Dreyer's English. And it's by the copy chief of, <sighs> I hope I'm going to get this right. Is it Penguin Random House? I think he's the copy chief of Penguin Random House. And this book, Dreyer's English, is um, is about grammar. It's a grammar book. But he starts, the excerpt that I read, he starts about um, with a list of, I think it's 12 words that you should banish yourself from using and, and to practice not using them in order to see how many times you, you do use them. And I, I'm almost certain that almost is one of them. But it's yeah. <laughs> those words, it's like perhaps, and you know, it's all those kind of filler words yes. that, um, yeah. that um, again, weaken, you're right, it totally weakens it. And it all adds up to, you know, now I'm just mad. <laughs> yeah, oh, I do that. It, it's as if it is as if he felt like this. Well, he felt like that, or he didn't, you know, and um, right. I'm I started to spot it now. Okay, great. Well, like, you know, like a, a good rap when you give somebody negative feedback, you need to wrap it. And you said at the beginning, it's good writing. And I'm going to remind the reader that it's a great story. And, and Brian's blurb, Brian Cohen has done a spectacular job on the blurb on this book. And the blurb itself really brings out what a strong story it is it's a great story um but it needs some work in the well, writing well it you know if if you want to try to get to the next level yeah it, it absolutely does and i'm going to have um for your readers uh a little cheat sheet on head hopping that they can download um and it and it touches a little bit on some pov things and uh, you can spend your whole life studying this stuff and trying to understand it. And and I don't know that I even do <laughs> at this point, my own self, it's quite complicated, but um, I, I do have some guidance to help people um, look for this in their own work uh, that, that we can share. Superb. Jenny, as always, it's an absolute pleasure and uh, hugely illuminating talking to you. Thank you so much indeed, Jenny. And uh, so we'll fun. sign off until we go. In fact, we are hatching a plan to do a special deep dive into revision, which may or may not coincide with an author not, not a long way away uh, who's just finished their first draft. I love that phrase, we're hatching a plan. We are hatching the plan, <laughs> dastardly. We're almost hatching a plan. No, we are. We're definitely we're hatching, hatching a plan. We're hatching a plan, yeah. So well, revision. That's gonna... That's going to spur you to finish because if yeah. we hatch a plan, that means you got to finish. I am definitely spurred to finish. I've got my spurs on. Do it. Jenny, okay. Thank you so much. We'll speak to you next time. Okay. Bye.
This is the self publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. So Jenny called it head hopping, which is when you describe a scene from multiple points of view, but you don't make it you don't make it clear. And it became, I mean, it really was head scratching trying to work out who was seeing who and who was who was even talking at one point. Yeah, you can do it. I mean, I'm reading um, uh, what's his name, Jason Matthews, I think, uh, who wrote the uh, the Kremlin's Candidate at the moment, which is. Um, uh, Dominika Ergarova is is the lead character. Was in um, Red Sparrow, the film with Jennifer Lawrence. Um, so he's a really good writer, um, but he does have a habit of within scenes jumping from one perspective to the other, and he just about pulls it off. Um, it, but it does annoy me um, because, and this is just a personal preference for, as a reader. I, it, it annoys me because it just doesn't feel it's much. The the author is being much too. Um, what's the word omniscient really people don't in real life i don't know what you're thinking you're probably thinking what the hell is mark talking about now Um, but in in real life i I can't know what you know and it just feels for me when i'm reading something i like to uh, have my point of view restricted to the character one character at a time and that's not to say um, and i do this all the time you i jump around from character to character from chapter to chapter and sometimes from scene to scene within chapters but what I won't do is is have two is have you know character X says, um, well, I I think he's this means this, and then character Y will say, well, I think that actually means this because that that is head hopping and it can be very confusing for the reader. And so yeah, I try to avoid that. Yeah, indeed, and I think separate scenes, and I I certainly do that, and um, but I've been under Jenny's tutorship, so um, I was this was pointed out to me early on, but it is something to avoid, and there are ways around it. And Jenny's not, produced not to avoid. I, I think you can do it. It's nothing wrong with doing it, but you, it's very difficult to do, to do it properly. And I think um, you know there are no rules. If if there were rules and we could never do things like that, then you'd never get clever. Um, you know things like Bright Lights, Big City, kind of clever, intelligent, um, genre-pushing books that go in, in second person, present tense, for example. You wouldn't get people doing funky exper- experiments like that. But I think for writers in the kind of genre that, that Michael and I write, and then also that you write, and I think that isn't necessarily the place to fill those kinds of literary experiments. What you're, you're trying to do is to deliver something that is is clear, it's propulsive, and there's nothing that's going to confuse the the reader. So, you know, which character's perspective am I seeing this from? Um, so, I, I wouldn't be pres- prescriptive about it, but I would say in almost every case, for me, uh, certainly, I, I would avoid that. But you know, your mileage your mileage may vary. Okay, I'm just having a quick look at what uh, Jenny's provided for us for this. So, if you go to um, selfpublishingshow.com forward slash book lab five. Uh, you'll get from Jenny uh, an annotated example of head hopping of when it doesn't work. Um, and then you will see also she's given us her own edits on the look inside portion of Michael's book. So some scribbling uh, all over that in, in green ink, which is great. And then a, a really good uh, sort of single page description of how to avoid head hopping. So really worth having. Thank you very much indeed, Jenny, for that. It's been brilliant. Uh, yeah, it has been good. Now, we've got to hear from one more person, which is Michael himself. So did he cry into his tea or did he take it like a man? This is uh, this is how Michael reacted to that criticism. This is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. OK, well, look, we're running now, Michael. So um, so you've had a look at the uh, the feedback. We'll deal with them, oh, I yeah. guess, <laughs> one at a time. Um, First of all, the cover. What did you think about Stuart uh, and my um, comments? Did you think that was fair? Yes, yeah. I, it's like I said to Stuart. I've been in touch with Stuart, you know, and he, he said, I hope I haven't offended you. And I said, listen, my wife said to me, if you don't like what's happened, you shouldn't have joined, basically. You know, you shouldn't have volunteered. Um, I've watched each video three times. Wow. Because I wanted to make sure that... Um, you know, that I've got a grip of everything. Um, <clears throat> Stuart, as I just told you, I've been in touch with Stuart and we're putting something together in July. Oh, brilliant. Okay. So, I mean, so I, I guess the main thing, Stuart, thought is that you've done, you done it yourself, I assume, or? Well, my cover? Yeah. Uh, no. Um, <laughs> I did have a, a book jacket that I designed myself on Photoshop and 
I didn't. I wasn't really happy with it. See? So, and eventually, I, um, I got into. I got in touch with a guy. Well, he got in touch with me about something. But it had nothing to do with book jackets. But he's a writer, Paul Cassell, who does book jackets. And as a result, something I did for him, he gave me a cheap. Uh, okay. Thank you. Um, one of your comments was, Michael has gone cheap. And I thought, God, God, God damn it, JB, right? Michael has gone cheap. And I thought, yeah, you've nailed it, James. You, you spotted it, yeah. It, that, that cover cost me 50 quid. Okay. Okay. So there's an old adage about getting what you pay for in life. And um, and it's, you know, it is so important, isn't it? The cover, the work we put into books, the cover is the the quick glance. Either they, either they stay and lurk a bit longer and possibly buy or they move on. So mm. we have those few seconds. So you're going to invest in a cover with uh, with Stuart. Um, yeah, there's a, for somebody like me, um, coming to the end, if you like, of my writing career, to think of investing that kind of money Maybe if I was twenty years younger, I would, you know, be quite happy to do it. Um, I did. I did have a book jacket designed by a professional, one of my other titles, and um, that cost me about two hundred eighty pounds. Um, and I think that was probably encouraged me once I got into this book lab, um, seeing what Stuart said and having a chat with him. So um, <laughs> the the SBF bonus helps as well, James. Yes, of course, you're a course yeah. member and um, you do yeah. get the VIP bonus uh, to yeah. help with that. Okay, good. Right, that's the cover. So um, out of interest, have you spoken concepts with Stuart? Have you got that far yet? Has he produced any ideas for you at the on stage? Website, I sent him, uh, asked him if he would um, take me on and he's, yes, he'll take me on in July uh, if I'm happy with that. And he's, he since sent me an, e um, an email yesterday um, saying that his pencil will be in for July. And he's asked me for um, a blurb. He said a synopsis, but the blurb will do. And I've, I've got an excellent blurb here, haven't I? You've got a really, we're well, going to move on to the blurb in a moment. So, so basically you're waiting for the concepts from Stuart. And uh, he's also asked me for what he calls, um, well, I think he's asked me for sort of comparison covers. Yes, that's what he did with me. He asked me the books that I looked at that thought this is the genre I'm writing yeah. into as well. I gave him a couple of names. Um, I, I think I would probably, I probably have to look at Robert Harris. That's the only thing I can think of because you and Jenny mentioned Robert Harris a lot, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. Well, he he mentioned Robert Harris as well, didn't he? Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good. Okay. Look, that's the cover. Um, you just alluded to the blurb, so you heard what I thought of the blurb. I thought it was a superb job, and you know, it's a good story, Michael. There's a really gripping um, conceit there. And uh, that came out, I think, in the way that, that Brian worked on the blurb. You must have been pleased with that. Well, when I looked at the blurb, which because I got here, and um, I've, I've heard of Brian Cohen a long time ago, and I think most of us have in SPF. Um, and believe it or not, some of your comments actually hit the nail on the head as well, James. What I liked about the, the, the way Brian um, explained the blurb He's, he's, in one line, he says, this blurb is keeping up the pace. Um, and if, if I look at um, that top line, black cop, he's a black cop with a big problem. His, his racist murder suspect is the front runner for president. And it's like you said, that basically uh, grabs the reader's attention. Um, I probably will have been reluctant to use the term black because... You, 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 you made um, a comment about that kind of thing. Sort of, it was a bit contemporaneous, if you like. But and so, I would probably um, would not have used that. But the way in which Brian explains it, and the fact that you mentioned that it's it's probably um, not a problem in America because, well, we, we we do we see so many black cops, don't we, on TV these days and in films and that. In fact. I don't think people of our age really do have a problem with that. Uh, so, yes, <clears throat> there was there's something that he, he mentioned, which I thought, oh, he, he said the black cop white supremacist was too juicy not to tackle. You know, he, yeah. he, he sort of leaps out of the pages at you. Black cop, white supremacist. And he talks about the everyman character on the outside, as it were, and he said some authors tend to lead with the villain. 
But Lieutenant Amos, who is the black cop, <clears throat> he's the everyman character and uh, he's the more more relatable character. Definitely. And, I, I think it's much more intriguing to think of him yeah, and, and much yeah. more inviting to read the story from his perspective than, you know, the presidential candidate with a sinister past is, is great, but it's not you or me likely to be, but we do know people who go out on the beat as cops. And also, it's, um, oh, I said that about it keeping pace with the story. I think um, you mentioned it, we've all mentioned it, and uh, a lot of people mentioned it. We can write novels, but we can't write blurbs. Yeah. Authors, you know. Um, us, all the time, as most of my books were traditionally published, I never needed to worry about a blurb. Occasionally, I would be asked if I could you know submit one um it is very very difficult and uh i'm, I'm actually looking at my blurb on my other computer which is behind this laptop you know um and i must say that when i wrote that blurb i thought it was fine i really did but you talked about repetition of words james that's what you said yeah. there's too much repetition and and brian agreed with that and he said, avoid the echoes. I like that, that phrase, avoid the echoes. Right? You, you mentioned Gus Mason. You mentioned him again. You mentioned him again. Or you mentioned the president, the president, or the white. He said, avoid these echoes from sentence to sentence. Don't use the same word or phrase twice. And that was something you picked, on, picked up as well. And it's when, you, when, you're being, when it's been explained to you, uh, this is where you're going wrong. You think, well, now I can see. I can actually, you know, everything is is being revealed to me. But do you think partly this is a product of um of, of the way that we work in isolation? So if you worked with a couple of other people and you read each other's blurbs each time, you'd you'd immediately have a layer of critique where the blurb wouldn't get through those early stages. But we work by ourselves, so we write it, we read it, looks good, you upload it, and it does. Everything needs a second look, really, doesn't it? Yeah, I was, what I was saying was the only person I can share the blurb with is my wife, Pat. But then she's, <laughs> bless her, she probably wouldn't have a clue anyway. You know, she would read it and say, yeah, that's fine, Mick, you know. Yeah, it's um, got to be someone else and, who, who reads yeah, and writes know, in the genre. We, it's not really that we're struggling and we're living in a garret where we're trying to write our books, you know. It is an isolated profession, um, unless you're, using a, um, a coach, an editorial coach, or you know, something like that, um, which I'm not. But. Yeah. Okay, well, let's move on to Jenny, because this really was the big one for you, I think, in terms of of work that you might want to do uh, in terms of taking on board the um, the critique. And Jenny pointed out a point of view issue. Was that something you recognised? Did it resonate? So could you say that again, please, James? So I'm just saying, let's move on to Jenny Nash's comments now. Oh, Jenny Nash. <laughs> yeah, so this is kind of the big one, wasn't it? Uh, and it felt to me like, oh, guys, a little bit kind of, wow, this is quite a, a lot of of change that you would have to make. So did you, did it ring true with you? Did it resonate, what she pointed out? Looking at the... It was almost though Jenny started off very gently. <laughs> And then she began to tear me apart, you see. And she said, it looked good. And it was an interesting scenario for a thriller. And then she picked up on this, the number of reviews. I've got 23 and Erin Kelly has 1,600. And the question is, how come? And she said, Michael is no following. So he has no traction. And she said, Michael can write, but why isn't he selling books? You see, so um, the, the question about selling books is something that's always, you know, it's always a question mark over your head. Why aren't I selling books? Um, she, when she talked about, we'll get on to head hopping in a minute. Uh, I must say this, first of all, every time I've written a book for a publisher, which I've done for several years, never ever occurred to me about POV, points of view, uh, not using too many adverbs, and this and the other, just, just wrote the book. Really. Mm. 
when it comes to this kind of um, clinical assessment of, of the way in which I write a prologue or write a book, you think, is, that, is this really what, what I'm missing? Is it because I can't attract the reader's attention because of the way I write? But we're looking at what is basically just a look inside feature here, aren't we? Sure. And this prison scene, I went through the book. There, are, I've got 10 prison scenes in this book. Because one of your comments, James, was I think Michael would have to do, uh, I think you used the expression extensive rewrite. And I thought, well, I can't rewrite the book, but you were referring to the prologue. So when I went through the book, and there's 10 scenes in there. Fortunately, they are not all uh, shaped exactly the same. This prologue is really like I'm watching a television scene or a film scene, and I can see the two characters, and I happen to know what's going on inside their heads, if you like, which Jenny referred to later on. Um, but going back to, you know, he says it, Michael was putting the reader in a position of frustration and disconnect. And this is where Michael's sitting, listening to Jenny Nash going, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There should be a passive agreement between the writer and the reader. Now, when she said that, I, I thought back to some of the stories of some of the books I've read over the years where I've picked up a book and I've been instantly drawn into the writer. One of my favorite authors was Hammond Innes. He could, he could take me away and put me into another country, another environment, anything, you know. Um, and I was drawn in straight away. Some other writers have struggled a bit, etc., etc. See, and I, I am not drawing my reader in straight away because my prologue lets me down, lets me down. Um, and Jenny says that I'm breaking this promise. I'm breaking this this promise of uh, the, the agreement between the writer and the reader. So let me get down now, really, to the nub of the problem, and this is the head hopping. And as Jenny opened up on this and began to explain it to me I could see exactly where she was coming from all right uh, when Babs Mason is sitting in that prison cell and she's looking at that young writer what the reader doesn't know is I know the identity of the writer and I know how that would develop in the in in the book because I've forgotten, I, I, I ignore that sound, don't I? I ignore the fact that the reader's not going to know that. Also, I know how Babs is feeling, but I'm, I can't, I'm not telling the reader that. When, when it said Babs hadn't listened to the question, and all of a sudden she says, What well, uh, can you, you know, oh, the question, and, and Babs repeats the question. And this is where Jenny Nash said, uh, yes. Who's asking the question here? And I thought, well, That's fair enough, that's true, yeah, because. Babs has actually repeated the question and it can look to the reader as though she has actually asked the question. Yes, that was a bit confusing. So so do you what do you think you're gonna do, Michael? Is it I mean, is it just the prison scenes or is there I mean, rewriting the whole book is gonna be a No, I won't rewrite the whole book because um well I won't, but the, the prison scenes, I went through them and fortunately they are not all they are, none of those prison scenes are written in the way the prologue is written. Okay, so the the point of view, the head hopping that was identified by Jenny doesn't permeate the whole book. No, no, no. I, I, I've actually rewritten the prologue twice. Okay. <laughs> and I shall probably have another look at it uh, because there's, there's certain elements of this head hopping that Jenny's explained, which actually... Would be a great help to anybody who's watching this. Yeah. Any writer that's watching this, what she says about um, she's talking about um, head hopping in the third person. Uh, must be limited to one character's point of view. That's fine. But then she talks about third person omniscient, where the writer knows what's going on in everybody's heads. In and she says in this prologue, Michael's switching from one character to another all the time. Yeah, and I can see that now. I couldn't see that. Yeah. So, 
So we should say that there is a, she's done a handout to go with the episode, which I mentioned in her interview, but people can get that at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash book lab five. And yeah, mm. that's the whole point of this, uh, Mike, is that people learn. So we're all, I mean, I've been working with Jenny and her team, so I've had a lot of this kind of rammed down my throat over the last uh, a few weeks and months of writing. And um, yeah, I go into every scene now knowing, because even third person omniscient, where the third person knows everything, still has to be described from one person's point of view. Because if you dro- drop between them, you know, in a, in a, I think we gave an example of someone buying a newspaper in a shop. If you jump between them, it just becomes really complicated to follow for the, the reader. Yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah. well... I'm relieved to hear that it was kind of a prologue issue and, uh, you know, maybe one or two others, but not a whole rewrite of the book because I was slightly anxious for you that there was um, a head and hands moment for you that you'd have to rewrite the whole book and that's uh, no one wants to hear that as an author. But so do you think as an experience of being in the lab, being the lab rat as you described it before we started recording, that you've uh, you, you've been experimented on and come out better informed? I I'm going to make. Um, I'm going to try and make good use of what I've um, been told. I'm obviously going to use Brian Cohen's blurb. Um, I'm going to uh, take Stuart Bache on to do design my new book jacket, and I will rewrite the prologue. The a minor problem is I can do these things are fixable, right? I can do the the blurb and I can do the prologue. I can do that tomorrow really and i can republish i can i can do that but i've got to wait now till july before i get the new cover i mean it could be the beginning of july it could be the end of july and i did say to, to Stuart, if you get an early slot then let me know and you know so the important thing is this although these things are fixable the next step is how am i going to promote and market this book so i've got to invest some money in promoting and marking this book with the new blurb, the, 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 the rewritten prologue, and I shall also make sure the other prison scenes are, are um, okay. And the new book jacket, this will be towards the end of July, probably August time, before I can start yeah. uh, advertising it. And it might be another month, maybe September, before I can actually see if there's any any effect. Yeah, well, it'll be July before you know it. And you've got, with the blurb, you've got a set of um, pithy little sentences that uh, that Brian's done for you that you can use as taglines in Facebook ads and AMS ads and so on. Yeah, I should use them. Uh, <clears throat> you can't knock it, can you? That is it. it he's, he's, he's nailed it. He's nailed it all the way through. Um, and this is what I like, something that Brian says, the last three lines of a blurb, he says, you, the reader must want more. He said, you've got to leave them wanting more. You've got to let them know what they're getting, and you've got to tell them what to do. Yeah. Uh, so, well, he's done it for me anyway. But you see, these kind of comments, in no doubt, these kind of comments will be in his book, which I've also got. Yeah. <laughs> I've got Brian's book. <clears throat> in fact, I should probably go back to Brian's book now and start reading through it again, because this. There's so much in there that helps people like me to um, – all this was just something I'd never had to bother with, right? Yeah. I mean, it was just writing the story. That was all, That's what mattered to me, just there was, writing the story. Because when you were traditionally published, there was an office full, in London full of people doing it for you. But now it's uh, – now it's you and me and a, an army of authors by ourselves. Look, yeah. uh, Michael, thank you so much indeed for mm-hmm. coming into the book lab. Thank you for talking to us tonight. Um, it's not always it's not easy to hear your baby your love torn apart sometimes by people uh, and forcing you to put it back together again but it's a very business-like approach to selling it as a product to almost move yourself away from it yeah, listen yeah, listen yeah. to what third parties say put it back together again and make it a shinier better product and hopefully it'll move off the shelf so you have to let us know in the autumn whether you've seen um, an improvement in sales that's what we want to hear I'm, I'm going to try and keep a record of what I do and I'll let you know anyway this is the self-publishing show there's never been a better time to be a writer so I thought Michael um, took it in a very logical way there was no emotional sort of response from him it was a they've identified this um, 
you've identified this and these are the steps I need to make. And the good news by the sounds of it is that the head hopping was something he was playing with in that particular scene and the look inside that was slightly different from the rest of the book. Um, so I, he, I think he agreed uh, in essence that it needed rewriting. I think he's already doing that, but didn't sound like he had to rewrite the whole book, which I was slightly worried about when Jenny first said, there's a problem here. Yeah, and, and if the problem is identified at the start of the book, then you know it, that's not the place to have a problem. You know, you, you, you yeah. want to be hooking your readers at that point, not just from the perspective of will they buy it after they've looked at the look inside. Once they've bought it, are they going to finish it, um, or are they going to put it down because they've they've found it it isn't working for them? So, um, yeah, it, it is. It's definitely something that you need to uh, make sure the the front end of your the first few chapters. And that's why we focus on those for this uh, that they are as as polished and effective as you can make them. Yeah. Okay. Selfpublishingshow.com forward slash book lab five to get all the goodies for this episode. And if you would like to go into the book laboratory, you simply have to be a Patreon subscriber, a gold Patreon subscriber. So if you go to patreon.com forward slash self-publishing show and support us at three dollars an episode you will be in the hat for the next round now we do have our winner of the auction the charity auction for tommy donver band who is going to go into the lab but he has asked us to park that for a while while he finishes his book sounds familiar so probably not until next year i think for him so there is spaces for the rest of this year we'll probably get a couple more in in 2019 so yes that's the way to do that good another visit to the lab uh, mark you can take your um your rubber gloves off and what uh, kind of lab michael, are you talking about well that's what michael said michael said i thought you know because i always joke about putting the white coat on he said for my one you needed to put the old gloves on <laughs> have a tub of vaseline um but yes we uh we can go and scrub down whatever you do after i think we, i think the audience has just got a uh, rather unpleasant insight into what into what goes on in the james black <laughs> laboratory a little look inside Oh dear. In uh, my head hopping. That's terrible. Good. Okay, look, that's it for this week. It's been a long episode, but definitely worth it. I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you very much indeed for being here this week. I hope you have a great week writing and selling your books. And I'm going to say that it's goodbye from him. And going for a shower, it's goodbye from me. <laughs> goodbye. goodbye. Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash selfpublishingshow. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing, so get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show.